like him so. Um, today, inshallah ta'ala, we'll deal with the topic of dealing with non-family um, members, close family members and friends that are not actually practicing Muslims. And what should be our approach in dealing with them? What is the best method of dealing with them? Okay, and I think before we even broach this topic, there are some things that we need to correct within ourselves first before we embark on trying to correct somebody else. All right, I think a lot of times when we talk about how to deal with a person who's like this or how to deal with someone who's like this, automatically our mind goes to the person when in fact our mind should go towards ourselves first and foremost. Because before you approach something as delicate as this, as changing somebody else's behavior or um, pointing out something in someone else's behavior, you have to look at yourself first and foremost before you approach that topic. All right, because there are some of us, you know, quite frankly, that are not fit or qualified for correcting someone else because they have so many issues that they have to deal with within themselves. And as some of the scholars of Islam, they say, let your commanding of good be good, and don't let your forbidding of evil be evil, right? Because there's some people who go to try to forbid evil, and they make the situation worse because they approach the situation unqualified from the beginning, all right? So, the just put some pointers up here. Some uh, my my talk will be centered around uh, these six points, right? Uh, and if I probably had more time, it would have probably been more than that. But I think this is sufficient, inshallah <laughs> ta'ala. The first thing is that um, before we can talk about um, correcting someone else's behavior or how to deal with someone who is not actually practicing Islam. Um, I think before all of that, I think we need to have a vision of what a practicing Muslim actually looks like. Because if you left it to every one of us, we would tell you we are the best practicing Muslims. And everybody needs to be like us. We are the standard. We are the bar. Right? Because that's how we judge everybody. We judge everybody by ourselves. Alright? It's like when we see someone else doing something wrong, we say, see, you should be more like me. But when we do the same thing that they're doing, we find excuses for why we do it. Oh, it's due to circumstances, due to the situation, due to the situation. All right? But you should practice what you preach first and foremost. All right? If we're going to find difficulty in dealing with other people, then make sure the character you're trying to be patient with is not something that you exude yourself. Don't be a proponent of a behavior that you are trying to correct and you're a proponent of it yourself. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala criticized Bani Israel in the Quran in a number of ayats for the same behavior of trying to um, impose on other people certain behaviors and you don't do it yourself. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in the Quran, Ya ayyuhal ladina amanu, lima taqoolu ma la taf'aloon, kabura maqtan inda Allahi an taqoolu ma la taf'aloon. O oh, you who believe, why is it that you say which you do not do? Kabra maqtan inda Allah. It is hated to Allah. It is detested to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that you say what you do not do. And this was after Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala had admonished Bani Israel. So Allah admonished Bani Israel, then he sent another verse admonishing the believers of this ummah. Allah said to many Israel, أَتَأْمُرُونَ النَّاسَ بِالْبِرِّ وَتَنْسَوْنَ أَنفُسَكُمْ وَأَنْتُمْ تَتْلُونَ الْكِتَابِ أَفَلَا تَعْقِلُونَ Do you impose or enjoin righteousness on other people, but you forget to practice it yourselves? وَأَنْتُمْ تَتْلُونَ الْكِتَابِ While you read the book, while you have knowledge of the book, أَفَلَا تَعْقِلُونَ Does that make sense? Do you have any intellect? Would it be smart? to enjoin or impose on other people to do something and you don't do it yourselves? 
So we might say that we're struggling with this family member or this family member that's not practicing Islam, but we may not necessarily be practicing Islam either. Who, who made you the judge, the standard, the gauge by which you determine whether someone is practicing Islam or not? But at least, the very least, you can make sure that you are not doing some of the things that you are trying to tell other people not to do. And there was a lot of poetry that some of the Arabs, they mention, فَإِذَا عَتِبْتَ عَرَى سَفِيهٍ وَلُمْتَهُ فِي مِثْلِ مَا تَأْتِي فَأَنْتَ ظَلُومٌ that if you blame somebody for a particular behavior and then you turn around and you do it yourself, then you are oppressive. You are an oppressor. He continued, Don't stop people from doing a behavior and then turn around and do it yourself. It's embarrassing. It's embarrassing for you as someone who's trying to correct someone with the behavior. Because you leave yourself open for criticism because you're doing the same exact thing. He said, That start with yourself first and foremost and stop yourself from doing the behavior first. And if you stop, then you will appear to be a wise person when you correct someone else and stop someone else from doing it. He said, and when you stop yourself from doing it, there will be people who will respond to your command and to, you know, when you impose it on other people, there will be people who will follow you and who will respect what you're saying. But if you are doing the same thing and stopping someone else from doing something that you're doing, then you appear to be a hypocrite. You appear to be hypocritical. And this even applies even dealing with our children. You can't tell your child, suddenly go pray, and you don't pray. This, it doesn't work like that. All right? It doesn't work like that. And the thing is, is that most of communication, some people say 70, some people say 90. I just read an article that debunks both of them. All right? Because they say that that's in specific situations where a person doesn't necessarily know you. And then in that situation, nonverbal communication would count for 70 to 90 percent. But in general, it doesn't. But nonverbal communication is just as powerful as verbal communication. And in certain instances, it accounts for more than verbal communication. Meaning people are looking at what you're doing as opposed to what you're saying. Meaning most of what you are communicating to the other person is not actually coming out of your mouth. It's through your character. Through your character, all right? So um, as the saying goes, be the change, right? Be the change that you wanna see in everybody else. You be the change first. You want somebody to change a certain behavior, then you be the change that you want to see in everybody else. Start with you first. So that's first and foremost in dealing with non-Muslim family members and relatives, is that you don't necessarily have to say anything, but by you, you know, displaying the same character that you would like to see them do, maybe that will have an impact on them. Maybe that will have an impact on them. The second thing is that when we approach non you know, practicing Muslim family members or friends. Our approach should be one of humility, first and foremost. Not the I holier than thou attitude. I'm better than you and you need to be more like me. But no, more so, I used to be like you. And I want to show you that you can change. You don't have to be like this. You can change. Your approach should be one of humility, not necessarily of arrogance and and of you know I'm better than you type of approach right Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentioned to some of the sahaba in the Quran because there were some people from Quraysh who used to oppress the sahaba and then they took shahada and became Muslim and some of the sahaba found it difficult to deal with them as Muslims okay just think about a non-Muslim oppressing you right and then one day that same non-Muslim becomes Muslim later on now you have to change your behavior towards them because now they are Muslim. You can't deal with them under the guise that, you know, the way they treated me was wrong. They're Muslim now and everything that they did prior to Islam, they're forgiven for. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentioned in the ayah, That you used to be disbelievers before too. 
until Allah conferred his blessing upon you and guided you to Islam. All right, so what they were doing is that they would not give these people greeting of salam. These were people who used to oppress them prior to Islam. And then when they became Muslim, the Sahaba would not give them the greeting of salam. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala admonished the Sahaba and said, كَذَلِكَ كُنْتُمْ مِنْ قَبْلِ فَمَنَّ اللَّهُ عَلَيْكُمْ فَتَبَيِّنُوا That you used, to, you used to be disbelievers before. So the approach should be one of humility. That some of us did not, were not always practicing Muslims, right? Some of us were not always practicing Muslims. But at somewhere in your life, Allah bestowed some type of guidance, some type of hidayah on you. Uh, the light bulb went off in your head. Whatever phrase you want to use to justify your transition from being a non-practicing Muslim to a practicing Muslim. All right? So, but don't forget where you came from and begin to look down on your family members and your friends as if they're less than... And, and as if you've always been like this. No. Your approach should be one of humility. There was a very interesting story about one of the Imams of Islam from the past. He approached a tyrant ruler at the, at the time whose name was Hujaj ibn Yusuf. Hujaj ibn Yusuf was a, an oppressive tyrant leader of the Muslims. And he was responsible for killing many of the Sahaba. Many of the Sahaba and many of the Tabi'un as well. So one of the imams saw Hajjaj ibn Yusuf making tawaf around the Kaaba. And he said that I'm going to go to him and I'm going to give him some advice and I'm going to enjoy what's good upon him. And he came to him and he said, Ya hadha, inni unasi uka. That I'm going to advise you, but I'm not going to be nice about it. He said that I'm going to advise you, but I'm not going to be nice about it. Hujaj ibn Yusuf said to him, Ya hadha, anta lasta bi khayrin min Musa, wa ana alastu shaddu min fir'aun. He said that you are not better than Musa, and I am not worse than fir'aun. So when you approach me, you approach me with mercy and humility, just like Musa approached fir'aun with one of mercy and humility. I don't care how wrong I am. It doesn't give you the right to approach me any way that you want to. This is, this is our approach as Muslims. We think that because when we're in the right, we can say and do to you whatever we want to because we are in the right. And as my mother used to say, even when you're right, you're wrong. Even when you're right, you're wrong. You're right because, you know, the person, maybe the behavior you want to correct is okay, but you're wrong in your approach. He said that I am not worse than Fir'aun and you're not better than Musa. So when you approach me, then you approach me exactly how Allah commanded Musa to approach Fir'aun. What did Allah say to Musa when he went? He said, go to him. He said to say to him, He said, shall I not guide you to that which will earn the forgiveness of Allah and the mercy of Allah in a nice way? And this was the first time Musa approached Fir'aun. Obviously, the second time he approached him was, was a little more harsh. As uh, Allah mentions in the, in the ayah where Musa, he said, That he approached Fir'aun the second time after Fir'aun rejected the merciful side of him the first time. And he said that you know indeed what Allah, what has been revealed has come from the Lord of the heavens and the earth. And I see you, Fir'aun, to be a person that is embarking upon destruction. It was a little harsh the second time, but the first time was one of mercy and humility. And that is the way that we approach people. We don't, you know, approach people with this, you know, this I'm holier than thou attitude when we want to correct someone's behavior. And Ibn Qayyim, Rahim Allah Ta'ala, mentioned in a line of poetry, he said, مقلتين كلاهما من خشية الرحمن باقيتان ولو شاء ربك لكنت أيضا مثلهم فقلوب بين أصابع الرحمن Ibn Qayyim رحمه الله تعالى said that make for your face two eyes that cry out of the mercy and fear of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that if Allah wanted to he could have made you just like the sinners because the hearts are in between the two fingers of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and if Allah wanted to, He could have made you just like them. The same people we detest, the same people we despise, the same people we hate from amongst our friends and family members because they don't live up to our expectations of Islam, Allah could have made them just like them. But for some reason, 
Allah had mercy upon us and guided us and didn't guide others. But that's not an open opportunity or open invitation for you to display your arrogance towards other people. Number three, um, to be merciful. That our approach towards our non-practicing Muslim family members and friends should be, our approach should be one of mercy. That we approach people with mercy, all right? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, especially if it's your two parents. Maybe your parents may not be practicing Muslims, right? Maybe your parents are not practicing Muslims. And the last thing that you want to do as a practicing Muslim is to, to approach your mother or your father with disrespect simply because they are not practicing Muslims. Maybe they don't pray. Maybe they don't fast. Maybe they don't do other things from Islam. But we are still commanded to be respectful to them. There's nothing that your mother or your father does in Islam or outside of Islam that would ever justify you disrespecting them. Nothing. Even, even if they call you to commit shirk. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in the Quran, وَإِن جَاهَدَاكَ عَلَىٰ أَن تُشْرِكَ بِمَا لَيْسَ لَكَ بِهِ عِلْمٍ فَلَا تُطِعْهُمَا وَصَاحِبَهُمَا فِي الدُّنْيَا مَعْهُفَةً That if your parents fight with you to associate partners with Allah, to commit the greatest sin, then don't obey them, but live with them in kindness. And this is disbelieving parents. So how much more would it be for parents who are Muslims? How much more would it be for parents who are Muslims, believe in Allah and believe in the last day? Islam would never justify or sanction that type of behavior towards your parents. So our approach should be one of mercy, you know, and as Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in the Quran, وَاخْفِذْ جَنَاحَكَ مِنَ الظُّلِّ مِنَ الرَّحْمَةِ That you lower your wing of mercy and forgiveness towards other people, especially the believers. Lower your wing of humility and of mercy to the believers. And I'll give you an example. There was a very, um, a very serious incident that happened during the time of the conversion of one of the Sahaba. His name was Sa'id ibn Abi Waqas, right? And this particular companion, he took Shahada as a young kid and his mother disliked the fact that he took shahad, right? Listen to what Sa'ad said. He said, مَا سَمِعَتْ أُمِّي بِخَبْرِ إِسْلَامِ حَتَّى ثَارَتْ ثَارَتُهَا وَكُنْتُ فَتًا بَارًا بِهَا مُحِبًّا لَهَا فَأَقْبَلَتْ عَلَيَّ وَقَالَتْ يَا سَعَدْ مَا هَذَا الدِّينَ الَّذِي دَخَلْتَ فِيهِ وَصَرَّفَكَ عَنْ دِينِ أُمِّكْ وَأَبِيكْ والله لا تدعنا دينك الجديد ولا آكل ولا أشرب حتى أموت في 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 فؤادك حزنا علي ويأكلك الندم علي فعلتك التي فعلت وتعيرك الناس أبد الدهر. His mother. So he said, well, my mother heard about the news of my conversion to Islam. And although we're looking at someone who converted from Kufr to Islam, let's look at it from the perspective that some of us were not practicing Muslims and then we decide at one moment to be, you know, mustaqeen. We decided on, on, on an occasion to be, you know, steadfast in our religion, right? Mutadayyin. We decided to be practicing Muslims, right? And there are Muslims parents who have a problem when their children become religious. When you start to grow a beard, your mother or your father may have a problem with that. When you start going to the masjid five times a day, your mother and your father, they may have a problem with that. All right, for a number of reasons. Mainly because the, that comfort zone is no longer there. You know, they, they have to look at you in a different light and they have to deal with you differently now. And for people, that's, you know, that's uncomfortable. It's uncomfortable to have somebody transition from one phase to the next and then you have to deal with them like that. You know, people love comfort zones. We love dealing with people. And many of us experienced that when we first became Muslim. When we became Muslim and then we went around our non-Muslim uh, friends and family members, it was just as difficult for us to deal with them as it was for them to deal with us. Because now we're no longer, you know, hanging in clubs and drinking and partying. We're no longer doing that anymore. And it's difficult. He says, so when my mother heard about the news of my conversion to Islam, 
She came to me and she said, Ya Sa'ad, ma hadha al-deen alladhi dakhalta fi? What is this religion that you have entered into now? And you have abandoned the religion of your mother and your father. She said, Sa'ad, you are going to abandon this new religion of yours or I'm not going to eat or I'm not going to drink until I die. Hatta amut. Until I die. She said, and when I die, يَأْكُلُكَ الْحُزَنْ عَلَيَّ Grief will eat you up because of what you did to me. Grief will eat you up because of what you did to me. She said, and people will blame you because of what you did to me. People will find fault with you for the rest of your life because of what you did to your mother. Subhanallah. Sa'ad, he said to his mother, after they had to literally pry her mouth open and force feed her because she wouldn't eat. She wouldn't eat and she wouldn't drink until he denounced his faith. But listen to what he said to his mother. He said, Ya um, ya umma, inni alay, alayki shaheed. Walakin, walakinni ashaddu hubban lillahi wa rasuli. Wa wallahi law kana laki alf nafs fa kharajat minki nafsan ba'da nafs ma taraktu dini hadha bi shayin. He said, oh my mother, my dear mother, ya umma, oh my dear mother. He said, I love you. I love you. He said, but I love Allah and his messenger more. I love you, but I love Allah and his messenger more. He said, and I swear by Allah, I swear by Allah, if you had a thousand souls, and each soul was to come out of your body one after the other, one after the other, you would run out of souls before I would denounce my faith. Mm. And when her mother, when his mother started to see that, you know, a jid, she saw that he was serious about this, she began to eat and drink and she accepted the fact that he was a Muslim and he was not going to denounce his faith. So my point is that, you know, no matter how much, you know, opposition you receive from your family for being religious or being a practicing Muslim, it never gives you an open invitation to be disrespectful to your parents or be disrespectful to your relatives, right? And leave room for opposition, which is the next one. Leave room that, you know, people are not, everybody doesn't want to be religious. Everybody doesn't want to be spiritual. Everybody doesn't want to be like that. Even though we say we're Muslims, everybody doesn't want to be spiritual. Everybody doesn't want to be righteous. Everybody doesn't want to be religious or practicing Muslims. Some people are okay with saying they're Muslim, not eating pork, and you know, married and taking care of their children, and they're okay. They don't pray, they don't fast or whatever. They don't, they don't want to aspire to greatness. Some people are just lazy spiritually. That's just where they are at that particular stage. And we can't get frustrated with people because they don't want to be practicing Muslims. That is not your job. That is in the hands of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. But you advise and you remind and you come around and you show through your character. And eventually, inshallah ta'ala, they will get it. They will see that, as Allah says in the Quran, that there is no running away from Allah, but only to Allah. There's no running away from Allah. Some people run from Allah thinking that they're going to find something on the other end of the mountain only to find Allah on the other end of the mountain. There's no running away from Allah. There's only running to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And some people, it takes them a while before they get that. Some people don't get it right away. And sometimes we get frustrated with people. But leave room for opposition. Leave room that some people are going to, it's going to be a struggle. Not that we're Muslims, we should know better. As I mentioned to you before, the rule of thumb is that we don't know better until we're taught better. When we know better, we do better. It's not that we're Muslims, we should know better. No, that's not the case. People come from different walks of life. People have had different experiences in their lives that made them the way that they are. And it's your responsibility if you're going to take on this task of changing people's character and behavior and presenting them a different side of Islam, you have to be that sheep herder that all of the prophets and messengers were. They were sheep herders, every single one of them. The Prophet said, 
He said, there was no prophet except that he used to be a sheep herder. They said, even you, O Messenger of Allah. He said, even me. Because it's a difficult task to get sheep to cooperate within a small, you know, area to cooperate with one another. And you learn through that, prepares you, cultivates you to deal with human behavior. Deal with human behavior, which is what prophets and messengers deal with. Okay, so leave room for opposition. I'll give you an example of this. Abu Huraira, many of us know him as Abu Huraira, very famous um, companion of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, memorized the most hadith from the companions of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. He was from Yemen, all right? His name, his real name was Abdurrahman ibn Sakhar al-Dawsi. Dawsi, min al-Yemen. His real name was Abdurrahman, right? He was from Yemen. He migrated to Islam, migrated to uh, Medina after embracing Islam. And his mother came with him, right? But Abu Huraira's mother was not a Muslim. She was a non-Muslim. Abu Huraira, he narrates and was mentioned in Sahih al-Bukhari. He said, كنت أدعو أمي إلى الإسلام وهي مشركة فدعوتها يوما فأسمعتني في رسول الله صلى الله عليه وسلم ما أقرأ he said that I used to, I was in a habit of calling my mother to Islam. Islam, <laughs> Which means that it wasn't a one occasion thing. That he just didn't call her one time, she didn't want to listen. Khalas, ikhsil yadik min. Wash your hands of the person because you called them and they didn't respond. Oh, no, that's, that's not your call. You continue, you be persistent and insistent. And you, you be consistent with calling people to Islam. Whether it's your non-practicing Muslim family members or your non-Muslim family members, you are patient with that. That is a task. Change is a process, not an event. It's not something that's going to happen overnight. It's something that happened over a period of time, right? So he said that I used to call my mother to Islam. He said while she was a disbeliever, while she was an idolater. He says, so I called my mother to Islam one day and she said something about the Messenger of Allah that bothered me, that, that I hated to hear, all right? But you have to leave room for that. You have to leave room that people are going to oppose you. He says, so I went to the Prophet Wasallam. He says, so I went to the Messenger of Allah while I was crying because of what I heard her say. فَقُلْتُ يَا رَسُولُ اللَّهِ إِنِّي كُنْتُ أَدْعُ أُمِي إِلَى الْإِسْلَامِ فَتَأْبَ عَلَيَّ فَدَعَوْتُهَا الْيَوْمِ فَأَسْمَعَتْنِي فِيكَ مَا أَقْرَى فَدَعُوا اللَّهَ أَنْ يَهْدِيَ أُمَّ أَبِي هُرَيْرَ إِلَى الْإِسْلَامِ He said, O Messenger of Allah, I was in the habit of calling my mother to Islam. And I called my mother to Islam today, and she said something about you that bothered me. He said, make dua that Allah guide the mother of Abu Hurairah to Islam. So the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, he raised his hands and he said, Allahumma hdi umma Abi Huraira ila Islam. Oh Allah, guide the mother of Abu Huraira to Islam. So Abu Huraira, he said, فَخَرَجْتُ مُسْتَبْشِرًا بِدَعْوَةِ رَسُولِ اللَّهِ صَلَى اللَّهُ عَلَيْهِ وَسَلَّمُ So I left out, excited, ecstatic, with the supplication of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam to go and tell my mother what happened. He said, فَلَمَّ جِئْتُ فَسِرْتُ إِلَى الْبَاثِ فَإِذَا هُوَ مُجَاثِ فَسَمِعَتْ أُمِّي خَشَفَ قَدَمَيَّ فَقَالَتْ مَكَانَكَ يَا أَبَا هُرَيْرَ وَسَمِعْتُ خَضْخَضَ الْمَاءِ قَالَ فَقْسَلَتْ وَلَبِسَتْ دِرْعَهَا وَعَجِلَتْ عَنْ خِمَارِهَا فَفَتَحَتْ الْبَابِ وَقَالَتْ يَا أَبَا هُرَيْرَ أَشْهَدُ أَنْ لَا إِلَهَ إِلَى اللَّهِ وَأَشْهَدُ أَنَّ مُحَمَّدًا رَسُولُ اللَّهِ he says, so when I got to the door, the door was closed. And I could hear splashing of water. When my mother heard my footsteps, she said, Stay where you are, Abu Huraira. He said, then my mother, she was, I could hear the splashing of water. And then she put on her skirt. And then she hurried up and put on her headscarf. Which shows you that there are some people who convert to Islam and automatically conform to the dress code of Islam. And then there are some people that struggle with it, right? There are some people that struggle with it. There are some people that struggle with it for the rest of their lives, right? But she understood that that was the covering of the Muslim. And she tried to put on her kimar, 
uh, as best as she could. And she came to the door, opened the door, and said, Abu Huraira, I bear witness that nothing has the right to be worshipped except Allah. And I bear witness that Muhammad is the messenger. So you leave room for opposition and never underestimate the power of dua. You want your family members to be righteous? You want them to be practicing Muslims? Make dua for them. Supplicate for them. But don't give up on them. Don't say, you know, I've tried, I've tried, I've tried, I'm done with this person. You continue trying. All right? And the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, he sent some of the Sahaba to the tribe of Dos, to Yemen, to call them to Islam. So when they returned to Medina, they said to the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, فَأَبَتْ فَدُعُوهَا عَلَى دوس. فَرَفَأَ النَّبِيُّ صَلَى اللَّهُ عَلَيْهِ وَسَلَّمْ يَدَيْهِ وَقَالَ أَلَّهُمْ مَهْدِ دَوْسٍ وَأْتِ بِهِمْ مَا دَعَى عَلَيْهِمْ دَعَى لَهُمْ So some of the Sahaba, they came back to Medina after going to Yemen to call the tribe of Dos to Islam. Frustrated with the fact that they didn't respond. So they said, oh Messenger of Allah, we called the tribe of Dos to Islam and they didn't respond. Make dua to Allah that Allah destroyed the people of Dos. See what frustration does to you? Frustration causes you to lose hope and give up on people. And some people do that with their children. Don't ever let your children go. Those are your children. You let them go, society is going to do whatever society is going to do for them. And it may appear that they're not going to be anything, they're not going to be, I've tried, I've tried, I've tried. Never let their hand go. That doesn't mean condone their behavior. That doesn't mean pacify them. That doesn't mean appease them with the dunya to, in hopes that they would do the right thing. Set, set parameters, set boundaries, and make them accountable. But don't ever let their hands go, ever. <coughs> Never give up. So they said, make dua that Allah destroyed those. We called them to Islam and they didn't respond. The Prophet Sallallahu raised his hands and he said, oh Allah, guide the tribe of Dos to Islam and bring them to Islam, make them a benefit for Islam. And they accepted Islam later on. But the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, he never gave up on people. Even when he went to the city of Ta'if to call the people there to Islam and they pelted him with stones and threw stones, get out of here, nobody wants to hear that. The Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam didn't say, you know, oh Allah, destroy these people. Even Allah sent to him, Malik al-Jibal sent the angel of the mountains to him. He said, O oh, Messenger of Allah, I am the angel of the mountains. Ba'athani Allahu ilayk li ta'murani kayfashit. He said, O oh, Messenger of Allah, I am the angel of the mountains. Allah sent me to you for you to command me to do whatever you want. In shitta la'at faqanna alayhim al-akshabayn. Ya'ni al-jabalayn al-kabirayn. 